as our kingdom kids make their way down to Children's Church, I invite each of you to return with me to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Last week we had a few moments to be reminded of the demands that were beginning to emerge for Jesus' disciples as Jesus turns his attention towards Jerusalem. And as Jesus' attention turns towards Jerusalem, he begins to teach his disciples more intently about what it is and what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ to be a follower of the one whom they are inclined to believe is the source of their liberation, of their freedom, of their hope. And as they do so, Jesus says to them things that are striking and seemingly harsh and difficult. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. Let the dead bury their own dead, and you come follow me. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. You remember that. These are Jesus' words as he's beginning to make his way to Jerusalem. And as he makes his way, you'll remember he wasn't welcomed in Samaria. As he makes his way, he he discovers that as he's making his way, his disciples, who are meant to go before him, are not finding themselves welcome. And on the very heels of this event, Jesus gets 70 more followers. He invites 70 more to join the ministry. He invites 70 more who will go out, 35 pairs to go to every city where Jesus will go. That's quite an advanced team, don't you think? They will go two by two to every city city where Jesus will arrive, and they'll go to places that are certainly and expectedly hostile. Because they will go as lambs among wolves. And as they go, let's just say Jesus wants to make sure that they don't get distracted. No money. No shoes. <laughs> Just imagine sending our teenagers off like this, right? Greet no one. That's a great trip. That's some boondoggle, isn't it? No money, no shoes, and you can't talk to anybody as you go. I mean, it's, it's getting intense. I mean, we, we tend to, in our imaginations, imagine Jesus gathering up this 70 and meeting with them and all standing around and Jesus kind of giving them their, their directions and all of them being, you know, gung-ho and ready to go. Can you imagine how it must have fell on their ears when they found out they couldn't take their money purse? In fact, they had to go and be utterly dependent on whom they went to see. Can you imagine to go to a home, to introduce yourself, to be welcomed in, and then, as he says, eat whatever they put in front of you and be grateful for it. Could you imagine if we required that of ourselves today? In other words, discipleship. Following Jesus doesn't mean just trudging along behind him. It also means a kind of going. 
And not only is there this kind of going, but you need to anticipate, in fact, you need to prepare that the kind of going that it is isn't necessarily going to be, shall we say, characterized by the trappings of an upper middle class existence. In other words, when you get to your destination, it may be the case that they don't have the 55 inch, they've only got the 35 inch. You know what that feels like to go to a hotel? Go to the hotel, you're so eager, so tired, just want to lay on the bed and turn the TV on. Got this little screen. Then the zapper doesn't work. Oh my gosh, when the zapper doesn't work in my house, right? My point is that Jesus' first invitation to these disciples to make their own way is one that is pared down from our normal expectation. So much so that the disciple has to literally give themselves to the circumstance and be utterly dependent on their host as they arrive in these places. And as they go there, this is my favorite bit, and as they arrive there, having given themselves to this family or this location, what do they do? The scripture says that they, they heal them if they're sick. And having healed them, they say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now that's a very different model of discipleship than what we are inclined to imagine for ourselves and others. Years ago it wasn't uncommon for folks to gather up and decide that they're going to go, quote, hit the neighborhood. And they will have published tracks and they'll go around and knock on the door and they'll share the track with the family and then they would go to the next door and share the... I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that's not what Jesus is doing at all. Jesus is inviting these disciples to surrender the things that for them would be most typical of a life well lived. Who goes to another city without money, without shoes, and doesn't say anything to anybody else? And my suspicion is, it's because Jesus doesn't want them to get captured by, shall we say, the trappings of this adventure. Because once there, if they are utterly dependent on their host, guess Guess who they give their time and attention to? Their host. The, the point is that there's a, there's a kind of surrender that Jesus' invitation to this 70 calls on them to, to take up. There's a kind of surrender in their life that has to take place before they can find themselves in the places where Jesus says, you can say in that moment, the kingdom of God has come near. And as I shared with our children, we live in an extraordinary time and in an extraordinary place where the freedom to take up such responsibilities comes rather easily. And by easily, I mean there's no public impediment. There's no institutional impediments. There are no social barriers that would literally prevent any of us from taking up the call that we see on the lives of those whom Jesus identified as those who are to go. But we have to wonder about that call. We have to wonder about what that following has become for us. 
In other words, do we find ourselves in places and in circumstances where we would have surrendered to our host? So that we're dependent on them. Have we approached those to whom we would go in a manner that suggests that we have set aside our money and our shoes and talking to others, as that may play itself out for any of us? Now, Jesus isn't inviting us to live lives with no money bags, no shoes, and not talking to people. That's not what he means. What he means is, is that when you take upon yourself, the responsibility to do the work that is characteristic of the kingdom of God, then these are the kinds of things that you're apt to not need. These are the things that you will not turn to, to get it done. Because how it really gets done is you becoming that so that they can be healed, can be blessed, can be made new. Another way to put it would be, we as followers of Jesus literally have to give ourselves away. And friends, that is one of the hardest things for us to do, is to give ourselves away. You might say, well, Pastor, I'm not quite sure what that means or what that looks like. Well, it doesn't mean that you're going to abandon your life as you have it. But it does mean that the life you have may strangely morph over time. So that you find yourself making decisions that once would have been a function of your money purse or your shoes or those whom you greet, if you know what I mean, and now becomes a function of surrendering yourself or giving yourself to another. It could be something as simple as learning that your neighbor, your neighbor is seriously ill. And this is where our thoughts and prayers become problematic because that's all we seem to have for anybody, our thoughts and prayers. But it does take a, a, an ounce of courage and seriousness and will to go to your neighbor who you may or may not know that well and to say to them, I understand that you have a loved one who's not well. Is there anything I or my spouse or my family can do for you at this time? Or maybe that person you know is going through a difficult time in their job. Their circumstances have all turned upside down, and you know about it. Do we possess the intentionality, the willfulness, the desire to be in their company and to acknowledge the difficulty that they're struggling and have the will and the openness of being with them during those circumstances? Or do we just hear about it at work and it's like, yeah, it's a shame about Fred. Sorry that happened. Boy, I wish there was something we could do for him. Well, I'm going to keep praying. That's great. Sort of. 
Folks, it takes a level of risk to be a Christian. I didn't say a good Christian. It takes risk to be a Christian. It takes risk to go places, to engage with people, to encounter people in ways that have some depth to them that may actually cost us something. Your time, your energy, your money. It's not easy. Jesus says it's like lambs hanging out with wolves. It's dangerous. But it's what it looks like. Our magnitude of comfort is historic. There's no time in human existence where human beings have had luxury to the magnitude that we enjoy. And please don't hear me saying, so you got to get rid of the 55 inch. No, that would be tragic in my house. The point is, it's a willingness of heart. It's an openness of spirit. It's being prepared to hear and recognize and know that we live in a hurting world. When people go through change, when people go through loss, when people go through heartache, when people go through illness, all of these human dynamics deserve the presence of people who care. And we live in a world that needs that more than anything else. And if we're there in that way, when it comes time to go, it would be fair to describe what that is as the kingdom of God has come near. I'll finish with this. If you've ever been on the other end of what I'm talking about, then it's transformational. I'm not talking about the one who gives. I'm talking about the one who receives. If you've ever been in a place in your life where somebody took that time and that interest in you beyond what is customary and they open themselves up to you to just be there, to just help there, to just care there over an extended period of time, then you know what I'm talking about. And that's the work of the kingdom. Jesus went places that he shouldn't have gone. And he taught his disciples to be willing to go to places that we just don't go. And those places can be as close as your own neighborhood, as close as your own job place, as close as your own family, quite frankly. And that's what God calls us to as his followers. As we come to this table and we acknowledge the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ for our sakes, we remember and are mindful that as followers of Jesus, we too live in and through that sacrifice in this life. As our deacons come forward,